what you've just told us is that Canada has a constitution that contains a Bill of Rights very much like the American Bill of Rights, but much later emerging and with what I think is one major difference, which is, and uh, I should tell you, I have a couple of hypotheses on the table about why tyranny has emerged differentially in in different Western states. Uh, And one of the hypotheses has to do with the American Second Amendment, um, which uh, complicates the question about uh, usurping rights. So when our government is in violation of our rights, uh, it has to take into account that the population uh, for uh, both better and worse is very well armed. Um, do you see the absence of gun rights from, are they completely absent from the Canadian Constitution? Yes. Yes, they are. So uh, do you see the absence of those rights any differently now than you did in 1982? No. You no, don't? not really. Not really. I, I, it, it, when, when one considers, and in our particular case, and you know, I can't speak to the atmosphere and the circumstance in the United States when the Bill of Rights uh, came in, but I came, came to the Canadian one. And uh, at the time, as we get into this, uh, most of these things, when nations come together, you can go back to Solon's time in Greece, if you want, uh, when he was called out of retirement to try to keep the civil, the civil war from happening and bring the poverty-stricken, uh, almost slaves, together uh, with the oligarchy at the time and forge a new law, which tried to bring things together. It's always a bargain. It was always a bargain. And when we decided on this patriation, bring the Constitution home and the Charter, because it's a federation, all of the provinces were involved with the federal government in forging this, and each province had their own agenda. And so we started off with like 20, over 20 items on the table, narrowed it down until we, we got something that everybody sort of could live with. So there were other parts to that uh, Constitution Act, which included things like indigenous rights, minority language rights, n- uh, non-renewable resources, an amending formula, right, were all part of this, as well as the Patriation and the Charter. So they were all negotiated as equals, if you will, factors in bringing the the, the Constitution together. So in that context and in that light, when you consider what I just defined as the four areas, they're pretty clearly defined. They're pretty clearly defined. I don't know how you say any more about free expression or (laughs) freedom of religion, freedom of conscience in a Constitution. And, and I think a lot of people, at least in Canada, and I, I suspect in the United States too, and in the West generally, uh, sometimes confuse constitutions with ordinary federal law or state law or provincial law. There's a big difference, right? What, the constitution is the glue and the principles and the values which are supposed to encompass the new government or the new territory, as well as define how it's going to operate, okay? And then, then you leave the rest of it because these are principles, to the courts to more define and refine, right? And with custom and convention over time. So one of the things missing, and it's a more complicated and longer defining uh, discussion when you get into it, into that context, right? And so it always, so I always say to Canadians now, and this is my, like, I don't know how many podcasts I've done, but I, I guess I'm well over a hundred now. Uh, every day, by the way, I do at least one, if not two. And, uh, so that'll give you an idea um, how many that would be if I'm going back a year and a half or more on this. I always try to explain to, to people that um, when you talk, well, it took us 114 years to even open the Constitution. So these are, are, are documents and concepts that are not revisited that often. We must work it out through the principles that were defined and then work it out through the parliaments and through the, uh, the judiciary, which are other parts of the government. And so it's in that context that I say what I just said and answered the question. And, and it's one why, way, reason why I like podcasts better than going on a live program where they've got 30 minutes. Right now I'm negotiating with a radio station in Vancouver to go on on Monday, I think it is, where they're going to have somebody else on to the counter what I'm saying. But the problem is, you know, they have a half an hour and it'll take me, in, in my, not here today, but it'll take me, normally when I do a public meeting, which I do a lot of, it takes me 40 minutes 
to do the whole presentation for Canadians, to start with 1867 and come forward, and to put it in its proper context. Otherwise, it doesn't, it's not it's meaningful, I and mean, people will not understand it. Well, they're, they're arguing with me now, you know, I might get 15. Uh, and then you got all kinds of these ads in between. And so it makes it difficult to understand. And that's why, like your question, I'm still answering it now in the sense that, uh, the, you know, do you feel still comfortable with your, your, what you wrote 40 years ago, 18, 1982, and now it's 2022? The anniversary, by the way, is coming up on the 17th of April. So we're getting close to the 40th anniversary. And my answer is yes, because of the reasons I just gave. All of these things are bargains. Okay, well, I I understand. And, you know, of course, the same was true uh, in the writing of our Constitution. It's uh, it's all bargains struck Mm -hmm. by people who... uh, were in general extremely far-sighted uh, right. in, in a few regards, not. But um, but with respect to, to gun rights, I mean, of course, our Constitution was written uh, in the aftermath of a revolution. Exactly. One with, you know, muzzle-loaded rifles and muskets. Uh, and gun rights, of course, looked very different than, you know, machine guns show up in <laughs> World War Two and your Consti- and World War One, in fact. And uh, your constitution uh, was written more than half a century later. So, um, uh, of course, you would have taken a different view than the right. American founders. But I, I guess my question is this. I'm looking at uh, Canada. I'm looking at Australia. New Zealand, the United States, and I'm watching the same tyranny unfold differently in these places. And I know that Canada didn't have uh, the gun rights. I know that Australia had them and reversed course. And I know that we in the United States um, still, I have to say, we still suffer the cost of those gun rights. That I think ought to be something all Americans can agree on is that whether these rights are good or bad, they certainly are not cheap. Um, But what I will say is, you know, at the end of last summer here in the Northern Hemisphere, I was watching things come apart in Australia and New Zealand and thinking, well, why is why is that happening there and not here? And the two hypotheses I advanced was one, they're off by six months because this is a seasonal effect. It has to do with uh, winter having dragged on now for three months and the tyranny interfacing with the mood of the public or the mood of the government. And the other hypothesis was uh, that uh, our gun rights prevent that tyranny from breaking out here in the same way because it might meet a different response. And now that we, you know, we've effectively tested one of these two hypotheses, because we are now at the end of our winter and we have seen tyranny unfold and it has done so differently in Canada than the U.S., which suggests that actually maybe both of my hypotheses were right. They're not mutually exclusive, which is we were six months behind with respect to tyranny and it unfolds differently in a state where the citizenry is armed than in one in which it is disarmed. And so it is that question I'm trying to address with you, which is you've seen... Uh, I I know your perspective to an extent. You've seen terrible things unfold. You've seen your constitution violated again and again on multiple different fronts um, by the current leadership. And it is in that context that I'm wondering, you know, yes, maybe you had to strike the bargain you did, but would um, would Canada's constitution be standing up better if uh, the government had more to fear from the citizenry? Uh, a really good question, and I, I can't answer it. I doubt, I doubt it myself. We don't have the same um, history and culture as you, as the Americans have. As, as, so uh, we come at it from a different way altogether. All so, you know, gun, the gun rights were never even considered during the 1981, 82. By the way, this was 17 months negotiation. It didn't happen overnight, it was 17 months of talks between the various governments. The other issue with, with a Canadian, with I, I would have to respond as a Canadian is, given what's happened in Seattle and Portland and continues to happen and, and happens through the Black Lives Matters issue, and what is that? I just saw some stuff on Seattle last night. There are ongoing issues in the United States unrelated to the mandates, which call into question whether in fact 
um, uh, you know, the way the United States is unfolding right now is any better than it's unfolding in Canada. And if you include both the mandates and uh, the destruction of many, many cities and the murder rate that's going on in the United States, one would have to, as a Canadian, uh, take that broader view and say, well, um, I don't know about this, uh, uh, you know, because uh, as we look at our media from up here and look at what's happening in the United States, uh, and I defend you, I'm very pro-American and defend uh, your country a lot. Uh, I'm one of the, I'm foremost, I guess, promoters of America in, in Canada today who's speaking up. Uh, but I do uh, see uh, the cracks in the Constitution of the United States, which oh my may goodness. have some relevance to that particular provision of your Constitution. Yes, uh, there is no question that our Constitution is um, failing in parallel w- right. with, with Canada's. And right. your question about uh, the the BLM riots is a good one, but I must tell you, uh, my wife and I, I mean, we live in Portland. We, we watched this go down yes. in real time. And uh, it also gave me pause with respect to our Second Amendment, but in the opposite direction, because okay. what we saw was absolute uh, failure of the rule of law in yes. places like downtown. What we yes. did not see so much of was the same failure in neighborhoods. People would march okay. through streets in neighborhoods, um, and you know there was social harassment. But there was a question about whether or not, uh, as terrible as things were, especially here in the Pacific Northwest, yes. in Seattle and, and Portland, if it might have been uh, more... Uh, it might have been worse and been targeted okay. at citizens in their homes if uh, the rioters had not had the same concern about the well-armed nature okay. of the population. Good point. So Good I, point. I, we don't know. These are all, yes. you know, and I must tell you, uh, I, um, I'm a lifelong liberal. Right. Uh, I have changed my perspective on gun rights, uh, right. having watched yes. uh, events unfold you know yeah now that's a good point but then you can also argue well what was the cause then uh, of it in the beginning it did happen yes uh, and there were riots and there were a lot of disruption at least in the center parts of the city but i think it's a really good uh, discussion and uh, as a matter of fact i have never come out against the americans provision of, of gun rights i have never opposed it and uh, for example uh, when I've defended America, I've defended that that particular provision as well. Because you know why? Because I understand how the Constitution got formed. Right. I understand the history and context of the times. And I would also argue, by the way, as I do in Canada now, if you want to change it, we have a way of changing it, but it's not on the streets and it's not by bringing in mandates and over trying to override the Constitution with doing it the proper way. Right. Well, and that is the other thing that we have to say. Um, so I would say... I am both for and against those gun rights. I think I am now substantially more for than against, but you know, I do find the, uh, the cost of widespread gun ownership unacceptable in, in the sense that we have unstable people and that's an awful lot of power for, to be in the hand of somebody who can't handle it. Um, but you know, I, I do think it may be, uh, an important hedge against tyranny, which is maybe my primary concern. A, a very, a very, a very good point, and hard to argue against. I think, in, in the broader the sense of things. And the other thing is, I mean, <laughs> nothing is perfect, and uh, we've all learned that. If we haven't, uh, if we're, if we're, if we're, if we adhere to some of the um, Christian principles, and uh, you know, we all recognize that we're not, we're not perfect, and that we have to work out it day after day after day. The other thing that has to be mentioned, and I also mentioned. When I defend America uh, in Canada, is I think right now it's the longest surviving democracy that the planet has ever had. Number one, and number two, that one takes the Constitution of the United States in its totality. I don't know if man has created anything better to date, notwithstanding the guns, gun rights, and so you got to put it into that broader piece. Piece.